how NASA reduces system forces and motion using flexible body, multi-body dynamics presented by Dr. Brent Ross. EngineSoft USA is a CAE company focused on providing consulting services during the design phase of a product's development. We're experts in virtual prototyping. Today, EngineSoft is formed of over 300 experts in new technology and leaders in virtual prototyping and optimization. We provide customized solutions and leading innovative technology to supporting clients in complex situations. There are seven locations around the world. Our home office is in Trento, Italy. There's also locations in Turkey, Germany, Sweden, England, and France. Of course, we also have our location here in Dallas, Texas. Here's some of our customers by vertical. We do automotive, aerospace and defense, energy and construction, industrial, appliances, retail uh, consumer, and metallurgy. So you may see some uh, familiar names here, some people you may have worked with in the past or currently. So we have over 250 engineers and project managers specialized in different disciplines. Uh, and we've been involved in over 4,000 consulting projects uh, worldwide. Uh, we have integrated technologies. Over 1,500 customers around the world are using uh, our integrated tools. We have extensive CAE portfolio of instruments and technologies, powerful HPC infrastructure for internal usage and lease, and efficient and integrated technical support. Our training and knowledge dissemination is made up of over 130 dedicated training courses per year. We do on-the-job training, advanced training, and master e-learning dedicated platforms, stage postdoc programs, the EngineSoft quarterly newsletter, and the International CAE Conference. We've been involved in over 60 research and development projects. Uh, one example would be thermal optimization of e-drives. And here's some of our different skills. So we do fluid dynamics, fatigue and durability, crash and fast dynamics, process simulation, high performance computing, mechanics, tolerance analysis, optimization, environmental and vibroacoustics, and multi-body dynamics in partnership with multi uh, Motionport. Here's how to engage EngineSoft United States. Uh, I'm Hannah Arnold. Uh, oops, <laughs> I needed to change that. Uh, email address, I apologize for that. The number is correct. Uh, James Christ, here is his email and contact information. He's a senior application engineer. And then Chris Garcia is another one of our application engineers. So uh, you can reach any of us directly. I will be sending out an email with um, the webinar recording so you all have my contact information in a few days. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to James Christ. He's going to give a little background into Recordine. Thank you, Hannah. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So uh, Dr. Brent Ross is going to be talking next about a, a particular application, but I wanted to give some uh, kind of foundational information about the tool that he used uh, for that analysis. Uh, so this is Recordine, and it's a, a multi-body tool developed out of South Korea by Function Bay. So they uh, are experts in, in the field of multi-body dynamics, and in particular flexible multi-body dynamics, uh, which uh, Brent is going to be getting into a lot of detail on. Uh, but as, as an overview of the capabilities of the, the tool, um, very competent uh, solver with a lot of connections to third-party technologies uh, such as Kisoft uh, and ParticleWorks. So in the, uh, you know, the 60 second pitch of the software, um, some of the key features does all of your multi-body stuff that you would expect, you know, rigid bodies, joints, forces, et cetera. Um, the, the things that kind of separate it or, um, you know, make it unique are the, the flexible components that it's able to deal with. So both the, what we call reduced flex, this is the technique that's used in most other tools. So it uh, uses a superposition of modes. Um, so that you kind of find everywhere. Um, but we also do full flex, what we call full flex. So this is really a, a finite element type approach. So you get full nonlinearity 
uh, in both material and uh, and geometric nonlinearity, as well as contact nonlinearity. And then, as as a part of contact, that's something that we do exceptionally well. So in both analytical contacts and our uh, geo smoothing algorithm for uh, more general contact um, when you have like you know arbitrary CAD geometries. And then the the GUI that we have is, is very modern. So a lot of the tools kind of based in the 80s have an 80s UI and that can be difficult to train people on. So that's, uh, it can become important, you know. And then the, the interfaces, which I kind of mentioned. So interfaces for CFD, uh, you know, mechatronics, KISS off for gears and bearings. These are uh, all things that we do. So any any tool really depends on its solver. You know, you can have the best UI in the world. If the solver doesn't work, then it's not worth it. Um, you know, we have we have a great solver that's developed in-house by Function Bay. Uh, there's a lot of PhDs on staff that, you know, make that solver better every release. Um, so it works both in high and, and low frequency domains works uh, well with contacts and flexible bodies and, you know, all of these things. It's also customizable. So, you know, no matter what features are, are there, some customers will always need, uh, you know, something custom, and that's completely doable. There's also a lot of toolkits that are available for uh, common but complex problems. And then, you know, world-class support. So this is kind of all of the modules that we have available. I wanted to highlight a few that I think are relevant for some of the people on the call. So we have uh, track toolkits. So these uh, can make setting up uh, large track systems, you know, for agricultural or defense applications, makes those a lot easier than, you know, manually replicating link geometry. Um, but things for, for automotive, we have bearings and belts and springs, uh, gears, all these sorts of things. The interfaces that I've mentioned, and then all the, the flexible components are additional um, feature sets. For anal analytical contact, uh, we get new ones every every single release, but these are kind of a, a small sample of the, the analytical contacts we have. And when you have arbitrary geometry, um, we have a very ro robust uh, mesh-based contact algorithm. This kind of talks uh, in more detail about that. I'd like to include this video here. I think it does a good job of showing uh, the power of, uh, you know, a good self-contact uh, algorithm. And then a, a little more detail on some of the toolkits. So these allow you to very quickly set up common systems that are can be laborious to, you know, configure with the amount of contacts or the amount of uh, geometries that you have. So we can automatically create things like this, uh, this engine system. Um, automatically set up uh, belts and chains. So often you have to manually create these loops uh, and they can be time consuming. With record on, you basically just click where a loop is going to wrap around and it'll automatically replicate geometry for you. Similar thing for gears, you don't have to have uh, the CAD. You can just uh, give it the parameters and it'll create the geometry for you. Um, there's actually a, a new uh, gear model uh, toolkit that we have uh, called uh, Drivetrain, and that uses the KISSOF libraries uh, for even more robust simulations. And then I'd highlighted track earlier, so this is um, it lets you set these types of systems up uh, very rapidly. You can do soft soil modeling using Becker's theory. And then lastly, uh, I always seem to get this question. Um, you can do all the post-processing in the tool. So you can kind of go from original CAD all the way through post-processing without having to leave uh, the single interface. And that can be really helpful for learning the tool. You don't have to learn multiple different interfaces. So now I will pass it off to Brant and he can talk in more detail about uh, what you're actually here for. Um, before I do that, I did want to point out that you can ask questions in the chat or, or there's a particular Q&A feature. Uh, you might have to move your mouse around the screen. Um, you should have a box that pops up at the bottom, might be at the top, and then you can use that to, to ask questions. All right, and with that, I will give it off to Brant. 
Okay, thanks, James. Um, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some research that we did uh, that was sponsored by NASA, uh, and that was through a Small Business Innovative uh, Research Grant. Uh, so I want to clarify that uh, when we use the word NASA, we're just referring to their funding of our work, and uh, we don't want to imply that there's any particular uh, NASA endorsement because uh, they're they're sensitive that they don't want to have implied endorsements per se. But they did fund this project, and uh, and uh, uh, they are users of Recordine. So uh, uh, with this funded project, uh, we did uh, research in kind of two areas, and then after that, we presented uh, the information. Uh, at a conference uh, of AIAA, uh, that's American Institute of Aeronautics, Astronautics, something like that. Um, but they're the, you know, one, I think the main aerospace uh, organization, uh, they have a, a big uh, meeting each year called SciTech and they, they have four to 5,000 people come. So it's a, it's a huge thing. Uh, so, uh, I actually, uh, we split the work into these two papers, and, and this is, today is the first time I've ever presented all this together. And uh, so myself and uh, Nelson Wu were involved with this uh, project, and then also uh, uh, Professor Joseph Blandino from the Virginia Military Institute. Uh, and uh, so uh, what we're looking at uh, is that some of the NASA projects have, uh, they're looking at spacecraft and, and they want to send them out to the, you know, the outer planets in the solar system. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, kind of challenging to uh, like provide fuel for such a long mission. So then they tend to look at uh, using uh, power, uh, you know, basically uh, engines that are uh, using electrical power. And so then there was interest in having, you know, very large uh, 300 kilowatt level solar arrays on the spacecraft. And uh, so these arrays, when they're all deployed, um, there's quite a number of them. And actually, uh, they cover as much area as like a football field. I mean, just huge. But it's, it's a set of, of different solar arrays. So uh, uh, here we were simulating uh, one solar array. And, uh, but still uh, over 40 feet long, um, so a very large structure. And uh, so uh, with the solar rays, just like uh, many other products, uh, it can be very important to basically with simulation sort of walk through like the manufacturing assembly process. So in the case of the solar array, you know, it starts out, it's created and it's a relaxed position, you know, de being deployed. And so then uh, in order to study uh, the deployment process that might occur in space, then we have to go through a stowing process and, and basically roll things up. And we'll walk through these steps uh, in, in just a moment. And uh, there's also interest in looking at the dynamics of the deployment uh, because the structures are uh, very lightweight, and so we want to make sure that during the dynamics of deployment uh, that nothing is failing. Um, and uh, and then uh, another objective then is we went, started, you know, we started uh, interacting uh, with engineers at NASA and started doing these kind of studies, and we found that certain aspects were very uh, tedious and just took a long time. So we wanted to research how we could automate those tasks uh, in order to improve the, the efficiency of the whole simulation process. And uh, so then uh, what we did is we developed automation tools layered on Recordine um, with the idea that, you know, to develop uh, independent, uh, you know, software tool to do a certain thing, it's really almost impossibly time-consuming and costly. Um, but if there's a way to leverage an existing platform and do some automation, then, uh, then that can become a reasonable thing for a company to not only do, but also to have, you know, that tool be supported over time, you know, the custom tool to their own uh, personal uh, process. And, and the other thing is that, um, 
uh, with these uh, automation tools, you know, part of what's being automated may include, uh, you know, uh, sort of personal uh, custom information uh, that the company has a database for, and that can be done and integrated into the software and then without it being, you know, being made available to other people, which is, uh, can be an important consideration. So as we look at the uh, different steps, then uh, as we go through here, A, A through uh, D. Um, so first of all, uh, we're looking at a solar array. There's a tube on each side. And uh, with that tube, um, it's actually formed as a cylinder, but then there's a slit on the bottom. And then as you see with the arrows here on A, uh, basically the that tube is just uh, pulled apart and and flattened enough to start wrapping on the mandrel. And then in step B, then we see the rolling up of the tube on this mandrel, which is this uh, purple uh, component. And then uh, finally C is the deployment. And then D is uh, looking at the dynamics of the deployed solar array, um, you know, uh, as a consequence of spacecraft maneuvers. And uh, so actually step D, uh, we're gonna focus on uh, with the second half of the presentation. So those are the steps. And so here's just showing some of the results. So here we're gradually applying pressure on the tube. And then it's, you can see that when we get to the critical pressure, then the tube you know, flops over and forms right on the mandrel. Um, so you can see, you know, the tube's responding to the pressure, but you know, you can see that the, this response here is kind of uh, almost instantaneous when it finally happens. And uh, so uh, we'll see with the process automation, we had to do some things to help, uh, uh, help the engineer with setting the proper parameters on the model in order to make uh, uh, this part of the process uh, work very efficiently. Okay, then the next step, rolling up the tube. So you can see it's a matter of uh, rotating the mandrel. And you can see that the tube is, as this rolling process occurs, then the flattening process is occurring on the tube, you know, as we go up. Um, so again, uh, to do this, uh, you know, contact is very important. Um, you know, the mandrel is actually a rigid body. And uh, the mandrel is actually uh, also, you know, a, a hollow body. Um, and, you know, very thin, very lightweight, but because there's no slit down, you know, anywhere it's, it's all in one piece, then it's relatively stiff. So we consider that to be a rigid body. And then uh, finally we can deploy the system. So this shows the overall system. So again, we have a tube on each side. In the center is a solar blanket, and that solar blanket is holding all the solar cells and all the wiring. And uh, it can be thought of as basically uh, sort of a fabric mesh. It's, uh, it's not stiff at all. Um, and, you know, with the mass of these solar cells on it, um, you know, then this is, becomes a bit of a dynamics challenge um, because you have substantial mass and not so much stiffness. And, and we'll see the effect of that a little bit later. But this is the deployment process, you know, of high interest. So uh, as, as we did the simulation, um, you know, we always want to make sure that we're getting accurate results. And uh, actually, as we first did the simulation, um, you know, we didn't have uh, information from tests initially, but eventually we were able to find out, okay, what, what information has been measured. And the attribute that we're looking at here is what is the torque that the tube is applying on the mandrel when it's deploying. And basically, you know, since the tube, you know, the, the free position of the tube is with a circular cross section. So when we flatten it out um, in this transition zone, you know, the fact that there's all this strain energy, uh, those forces uh, all combine together in order to want to, you know, unroll uh, the system. And uh, so this deployment torque is of high interest to people. And uh, in this case, we're able to uh, replicate it uh, within a few percent. And, uh, you know, with the, with the system analysis, uh, you know, if, if, 
if we can get within 10%, then we're, we're feeling pretty happy. You know, 5% is great. Um, 2%, you know, is like excellent. And, and I have to admit that, uh, you know, some of this might have been, uh, you know, uh, you know, there would still be some variation here, but, you know, certainly we were well within, you know, a 5% error, which, which is excellent. And um, so, so then when, when they control the deployment of the solar array, Actually, there's a mechanism we're not showing because it's uh, proprietary to the contractor. Um, but that mechanism is controlling the deployment and it's actually using up, uh, I calculated about 90% of all the energy goes into the, all the damping and so forth needed to keep this thing under control because the dynamic system we're looking at here is is you know basically the tube is like a you know a coil spring the way it's uh, rolled up like this and just like uh, any coil spring if you just let it go then it will just uh, be kind of a uh, uh, motion will be chaos and so forth so that that's why it's critical to have uh, the damping mechanism to control the motion but at the same time there has to be enough energy in the tube to cause the deployment to reliably occur uh, and overcome the damping in, in the uh, deployment mechanism. So we, we've reviewed the, the three major tasks here for this uh, first half of the presentation, which is forming the tube, uh, rolling it up, um, you know, forming tube to the mandrel, rolling it up, and then deploying it. And you can see what we've done here. This is in Recordine itself uh, using you know, the tools that are provided uh, with uh, the core, you know, Recordine professional package. Uh, there's a tool called ProcessNet. And uh, so we use ProcessNet to develop uh, scripts and uh, interfaces. And, and then we could also define these icons, which could be added to the Recordine interface. So, you know, this is what can be set up for an organization that when they start up Recordine, uh, then all these functions are made available. And with the user interface, what we've done here is, you know, the, the user interface by just going from left to right, we're walking through the process that the engineer would go through. And you can see that there's two icons for each step. So the first one is to set up the simulation. And then the second one is to then run the simulation. So for each of the three steps, we see that pattern setting up, running, and so forth for each of the three. So um, in preparing to use this uh, set of uh, scripts and tools, uh, you know, this walks through what, what one would need to do. So generally, uh, you know, the engineers have available to them geometry, and then that geometry can be meshed. So uh, if they have the whole system laid out, uh, that's fine. But uh, you know, we're we're assuming that the t the uh, tubes are the same on on both sides. So the preparation here would be to uh, uh, eliminate one of the tubes, and uh, also uh, we can remove that uh, solar blanket at this point um, of getting set up. And then, as far as uh, you know, forming the tube onto the mandrel, uh, then, you know, here we have a way to set up, uh, you know, the various aspects of contact and so forth. So the mandrel, um, uh, what, we, what we do is we set up a, a cylinder so that, uh, you know, as James mentioned, all the different analytical contacts, uh, we have the, me the tube mesh interacting, you know, with a cylinder, piece of cylinder geometry so that it's smooth and fast. And then, uh, so we automatically set up the contact. And, um, and, and so that involves, you know, things dealing uh, with the tube itself and uh, nodes. And so, we, you know, we, by the way, ProcessNet is using um, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio. And um, so, you know, uh, we really have a rich environment to set up very sophisticated dialog boxes. So we have a select button. You can select nodes, pick nodes off the screen and so forth. And then, uh, you know, custom help is provided with this explain button. So with this dialog box, we set up the uh, bottle for this forming process. And um, 
basically what we do is uh, as, as we go through this process, we're going to track um, looking at a minimum maximum radius uh, you know, on either side of the actual radius of the cylinder. And uh, what we want to do is to make sure that, you know, the, we don't have any like penetration of any of the mesh, you know, into the cylinder because there was uh, the contact wasn't stiff enough or something like that. So we actually track that. Um, and then we also are tracking, you know, the, this uh, forming process. And so then when, you know, the tube is all totally within the outer radius, then we know that we've completely done that task of, uh, you know, this end of the tube is uh, all set and ready to go. So, so the simulation will actually stop by itself when it sees all the nodes are in the acceptable range. Uh, the user can also, uh, you know, stop it manually if they see that uh, things are, you know, are such that they're happy with it, they can go ahead and stop it. And then as far as running simulation, um, basically uh, it will make adjustments and um, so it will, you know, iterate and it will actually change the pressure um, as needed in order to achieve the goal. So, you know, these things are really saving a huge amount of time because if people are manually starting the simulation and then waiting till it's done and checking to see if, if uh, things work the way they wanted, you know, that can really take a lot of time. But here we have, uh, the software uh, doing it itself. And uh, then, uh, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, the simulation, you know, didn't take hours and hours, but it did take some time. But at any rate, if, uh, you know, if the user launches such a simulation like at night, then it can sit there and go through a number of iterations and then they, they know they can come in the next morning and it will be done. Okay, so then uh, once uh, the tube is correctly formed to be in a, a good starting position with the mandrel, then uh, we're ready to roll things up. And so this dialog box, the user can specify, you know, what portion of the tube they want to roll up. And, uh, you know, there's this auto thing will automatically, based on this one input, you know, whether it's uh, the portion of the tube length or number of wraps, either one can be input and then it will figure out you know, the end time and things like that. And uh, so again, there's, uh, you know, the information uh, with the contacts uh, can be adjusted at this point. And uh, then the user is ready to, to run. Also part of the roll up the tube uh, setup is it will take care of uh, copying over the tube to the other side. So at this point we have you know, both sides of the tube uh, being taken care of. So then uh, we are rolling up the simulation, um, uh, or we're rolling up the tube in the simulation. And as we do so, then it's important to have a, a good uh, a torque to kind of, you know, keep the uh, this tube tight on the uh, mandrel here as it's being rolled up. So, uh, you know, we have ways of uh, looking and, and calculating what, what's the proper force that should be there. And so then, uh, you know, we're making sure that things are rolling up with the right tension. And then uh, as we start out, um, we need to get the tube to be flattened out. So we, we have this separating force that's applied and uh, and actually during the assembly process, I mean, this kind of a thing is being done uh, where um, in some cases people are actually doing this. They're spreading out the tube so that it's ready to start rolling onto the mandrel. So uh, in this case, uh, again, there can be some iteration to figure out what's the right separating force and also what's uh, the right stiffness. Uh, you don't wanna have this excessive node penetration. So again, with the uh, process automation, uh, we're, we're taking care of uh, those issues. Um, so again, we're looking at, um, you know, applying this uh, torque. Um, uh, and also we're looking at measuring then what kind of net torque occurred here where we're rotating the mandrel. And uh, 
So that's, you know, that's the information to see what kind of torque is needed uh, is, is an output of interest to the user. And, um, and again, estimating these uh, stabilizing torques. So then deploying the tube then is the third step. So we have in the dialog box, again, we can have graphics. You know, again, this is really helping with the ease of use. Um, to lay out these diagrams, the user just picks what kind of constraint they want to apply. Uh, you know, it depends on the situation. And then again, the end time is estimated based on the inputs from the user. And, uh, and then there's this auto stop simulation uh, once the tube is all deployed. So then uh, as it's being deployed, again, we have, you know, to mimic the uh, effect of the uh, dampening mechanism, uh, which we didn't include in our simulation, then uh, we are applying a torque to uh, keep things under control and also a balancing force to keep things stretched out. And um, uh, we kind of referred to this as our Velcro force. Um, so basically, if we're trying to not have relative velocity uh, between the tube and the mandrel, we want things kind of stuck together so they're not, uh, you know, having this relative velocity side to side, just like you might have if you had a strip of Velcro there. So that's, uh, we, we do that with the torque and the force uh, to keep things uh, so it's unrolling properly. And so then uh, this is the outcome of uh, doing all that work. Finally, we're ready to do the deployment. We see that, you know, the, the tube starts out with a high stress um, because it's, you know, made to be flat. And then as we unroll, you can see that, you know, in a given position of the tube, we're transitioning from the red, you know, and then to the light blues and finally, uh, when we get to the circular cross section, it goes fully to the uh, deep blue, which shows you know it's unstressed at that point because it's back to its uh, original uh, you know starting configuration. And in this case, the simulation we're looking at a uh, 20 inches of the unwinding. Um, so depends what you're studying as far as how far you want to uh, do this uh, deployment and things like that. So then uh, with this process automation, we developed a tutorial and then, uh, you know, with the help of uh, Joe Blandino, um, then he got some of his students because um, we wanted to see, you know, how long did it take to go through the process? And of course, you know, when you have a tutorial and the steps are all laid out, then that helps things go fast. Um, but the, uh, you know, we had great results. Uh, the students were able to go through the tutorial in three to four hours, you know, with all these steps. And, and this is a process that, you know, takes an engineer, you know, actually months to do um, is, is what we've seen um, because of all the adjusting and all that that was needed. Well, with the automation of the adjusting and so forth, it, it really speeds up the process. So in summary, you know, for this uh, part of the presentation, you know, what we found is multibody dynamics was a good fit for doing this. Um, you know, and specifically Recordine because it can do the multibody dynamics, but also has the nonlinear flex body, uh, you know, which we refer to as a full flex body. And, uh, and you know, the, the, what we just did there with rolling up the tube, you know, I've seen um, like with, uh, you know, some of the, Nonlinear FE tools, you know, they're very, they're not happy with this rolling up business. I mean, it's just too much uh, rotational motion. Um, but with Recordine, you know, basically for us, all the nodes are their own little bodies, and you know, we understand large motions and, and large rotations, and so then our our system is robust and uh, and actually fast. Um, uh, to do this kind of work because of that approach we're taking. So, you know, nonlinear FE tools are great for many things, um, but in this particular area of the large motion, large rotations, uh, you know, this uh, capability in Recordine is really awesome. So very robust and quite fast. Um, we developed this vertical application to uh, automate the three steps. 
and and we were able to demonstrate that it did make the overall process uh, significantly faster than it had been uh, doing it manually and, and with all this iteration. Okay, so then uh, the second uh, paper we gave um, it was about looking at the deployed solar array and how it reacts to spacecraft maneuvers. Uh, so we had the same people involved, but also another co-author was uh, Tom Kraft from uh, NASA Glenn. Uh, and actually he participated in both projects, but uh, he participated uh, a little bit more with this particular paper. Okay, so uh, again with these very large solar rays, um, the question is how do they behave when they're deployed and the spacecraft does some kind of maneuver? And uh, you know, there's going to be some nonlinear dynamics and they need to be understood. And one question is, can we do something to control uh, some aspect of the solar ray to reduce the deflection? And uh, so in this case, what we picked out as our event is uh, we want to take a nonlinear controller, we have our nonlinear solar array response, and then the event uh, is a one-tenth of a G thrust event. And um, a tenth of a G may not seem like a lot, but uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, this solar panel uh, you know, could not hold itself up under normal gravity. And uh, a tenth of a G event, uh, you know, for a space application, um, you know, over time, even a small acceleration builds up. So, you know, this is, uh, when, when you're operating the spacecraft out, you know, uh, especially if you're trying to get to the outer planets, as you go further away from the sun, your available power um, is reduced, uh, you know, you're, you're collecting. And so anyway, to achieve a tenth of a G thrust, I mean, that's a quite interesting scenario uh, to, to use. And uh, so when we looked at doing this project, we kind of thought back to uh, work we had done earlier with, you know, nonlinear controller uh, with a nonlinear system. And in this case, it was for a tracked vehicle. So if, if you can mentally piece together these uh, three images on the left, we have this track vehicle. It's it's doing a traditional uh, uh, what they call NATO a double lane change maneuver. So you're going down the road, you're changing to a different lane, and then you're coming back. And the question is, how fast can you do that and keep the vehicle you know stable and so forth? You know, which for we, uh, wheeled vehicles that can go you know really fast um, and may have like high CGs or something. You know, this notion of a wheel lifting off with a really fast lane change, you know, is, is a real concern. Um, in the case of the track vehicle, um, it's not so likely to tip over per se, but still it's a uh, indication of the, uh, you know, handling capabilities of the vehicle. And uh, in the case of a track vehicle, this one's a little bit of a tough one because we have to use the drive sprockets are not only maintaining like a certain vehicle velocity, but the drive sprockets are also, you know, the differential in motion between them is doing the steering. And, you know, with a regular wheeled vehicle, you can separate out the kind of the speed control from the steering, steering control, um, but not so with a tracked vehicle. Um, but this, you know, this shows uh, the basic controller, and you can see that it's uh, actually, you know, not too bad to define. And uh, and by having this controller, then we basically told the vehicle, you know, it's like, okay, you have this target uh, to minimize the error of between your position and the position of the target curve. And as you can see here with the controller, it's uh, following quite well. Um, so we had that experience and we thought, well, that's now this is like a new application to apply the nonlinear controller now with a system that has a flex body in it, uh, which wasn't an issue with the track vehicle. Um, so, um, you know, we've already talked about uh, the setup of the system. And as we look at having this normal motion, the question is, you know, uh, you know, what kind of uh, you know, deformations are going to occur, especially in the solar blanket, which isn't very stiff. And the big question, can the sol can the controller improve the apparent stiffness? In other words, can we add some intelligence on the controller to control the total deformation, so, you know, that, that would be, 
you know, similar to the def deformation you might get with a stiffer system, but we're going to get it by just having a smart use of the controller. So uh, in doing this, uh, we came up with the concept. If you, if you look at the mounting frame of the solar ray back here on the left, it's at a certain angle. And so the red line is showing, you know, if, if the solar ray were to be in its original uh, straight position, it would be in following the, or the uh, depiction here with this red line. But we have, uh, you know, applied some kind of acceleration. The solar ray has done some sagging. And now we have a new position of the end. And so we call this uh, deformation between the straight position and the actual position of the wind up of the solar ray. <clears throat> so as we go through a process of applying the 10th of a G uh, acceleration, then uh, what we can see is that we have displacement, you know, so it starts straight, it displaces, um, you know, almost 30 inches. And then uh, basically it, uh, you know, actually comes back um, to the original position, you know, so it's, it's, it's bouncing. I mean, the excitation actually causes bouncing. And uh, in studying uh, the system, we applied uh, different levels of rotational velocity to see how sensitive that was, uh, as far as looking at, you know, the driving torque and the windup. And what we saw was that, you know, the system is very well behaved as far as that particular input. Um, so, and, and we think we feel the reason for that is that the system damping on this thing is low, so therefore, you know, velocity effects are minimized. Um, you know, if you think about a solar ray structure, yes, you know, definitely low damping. Um, another question we had is, you know, for using, whoops, sorry, if we use um, uh, instrumentation at the end of the solar ray, an accelerometer. Um, you know, what kind of error are we going to have when we're trying to estimate its position um, uh, during these maneuvers? And so we actually got specs for an accelerometer, and then we took the error, and since, you know, we need to integrate uh, twice to go from acceleration to displacement, we took that error, took the worst case, did the integrations, try to see how much error we, we'd be accumulating, and uh, basically, we found that it was low enough to be acceptable. So that was checked out. So now we want to minimize that overall motion of the solar array. And basically the, the top image here is showing the solar array in its undeformed position, all flat. And then here we're trying to keep the end, you know, close to the same position. But this is during the acceleration and you can see that we've basically rotated the attachment point here. And so even though there's a bend to the solar ray, the end point is still right in a very similar position. And that we found that for a one-tenth G acceleration, that the rotation here at the end of the solar ray <clears throat> was two and a quarter degrees. And so that we knew that was like a sort of a target steady state uh, 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 rotation that uh, you know we would have uh, once the the dynamics settle down so that was like a good target <clears throat> so this shows um, our controller for this model and it shows all the different target values that we applied uh, with the controller um, and also you know the some of the maxes and so forth so we only had a, a certain torque available um, 7,000 inch-pounds um, but the nominal torque uh, that we found that corresponded to that two and a quarter degrees was this 2905 inch pounds. So that was a, a kind of a comparison point as you see here on this block for uh, calculating things. Uh, maximum speed of rotations, four degrees per second. Max, maximum wind up we set to be 35 inches, you know, although our, you know, our for our initial uh, assessment, we, you know, we were a little bit below 30 inches, but this was the max. And then nominal wind up uh, was actually 11.25 degrees uh, with that tenth of a G. Um, so with this controller, then uh, we ran the simulation. But first, for comparisons, you know, this is just showing with one tenth of a G, um, we're holding the position of the end here as far as the animation. 
fixed, you know, this is actually moving up in space, accelerating at a tenth of a G, and then we can see how the solar ray is sagging down, the tubes are, are being stressed, and the blanket is just, it's probably not developing much in the way of stress, but it's just sagging down because its stiffness is quite low. So substantial motion there of that solar ray. And then uh, the next step was, uh, you know, we were looking at, okay, we want to, you know, control things. Um, so with the active controller, uh, you can see, uh, you know, the, the, the torque that was occurring at the end of the solar ray is actually higher uh, without the control because, you know, things are developing the deep bounce, which then, uh, you know, causes a, a high torque back at the fixed frame. Um, so here with the control, uh, the, the maximum torque is much less, and then the deflection here, uh, remember our target was around 11 inches, uh, was the nominal. So basically we came to the 11 inches and then we we're able to you know, hold that. Um, let's see, I think I, let's play, I think I skipped past this one. Uh, so this one is with the controller and uh, it's you know pretty hard to see the rotation here, but as you can see, the tube is bending over, but you know the motion at the end here is much reduced. Um, so, so then the other uh, question we had is that we looked at the result from the nonlinear controller, and it's you know sitting there doing this rotation of a few degrees at the mount point. And, uh, you know, this shows what the output was from the controller. So we thought, well, what if we fit uh, kind of a smooth curve to this? And what if we just, instead of having a nonlinear controller and have to, you know, have a closed loop and be measuring things, what if we just said, hey, you know, we know in advance what kind of rotation we want to apply to the base of the solar ray for a tenth of a G event, acceleration event, and we can just, you know, uh, just have it be a motion control problem um, where the motion's predefined, and that's a lot simpler than have an active motion control. So then uh, this shows the uh, smooth curve that uh, we came up with, and then uh, we did a simulation with the motion control, and uh, just visually we can see that the end here seems to be under control, you know, pretty well. Um, just like it was with the active control. So that's, that's looking very promising. Okay, so then uh, if we plot out the actual displacement at the end, uh, this motion control is now the green curve. And we can see that uh, it's staying under control quite well um, as far as the displacement. Um, and, uh, you know, this is now a much more simpler, a much more simple uh, uh, approach to apply to the system. And then looking at the reaction force at the base of the frame, um, we can see that, uh, you know, baseline, uh, we're getting, you know, these big uh, changes in torque as the, you know, system is bouncing up and down. And then with both the controlled, the red, and then the, mo you know, just the predefined motion with the green, uh, the max torques are significantly lower than the max torques, um, from the base case, and uh, you know the system is is just in a smoother situation. So now let's look kind of from an end-on view, and and what we see actually is with the lack of any kind of motion control on the mount point, with the tenth of a g, you know we can we can see you know how large the deflection is, and see how the the tubes are actually shifting. And, uh, you know, basically, uh, we were kind of curious about that. So we actually uh, increased, you know, the loading conditions uh, for the simulation. And it tur turns out that, you know, going a little bit higher loading than what we had, then these tubes actually would buckle. So this, you know, the shift, which we don't even notice, you know, from kind of the side view, uh, this shift is basically an indication from the tube is like, hey, I'm getting ready to buckle. Um, so that's a, a bit of a worry, uh, but with the dynamic controller, um, you know, clearly the solar blanket's still sagging, but the tube itself, um, 
is under much better situation and there's none of this uh, shifting, you know, to indicate that it's about to buckle. So it really increases reliability of the system. And then if we look at the motion control, then uh, again, we see uh, very controlled displacement at the end and also that the tube configuration is looking great. So this is really, a, it looks like a better approach uh, to do it that way. So in summary, we looked at this, you know, very complex, very nonlinear solar array. Um, and uh, we were able to establish that uh, doing some active control can help it uh, behave uh, as if it were more stiff. So it's just a more reliable system. And, uh, you know, as far as the cost of making things uh, stiffer in space is, you know, very large because uh, it costs a lot, you know, per, per pound to get, uh, you know, your payload up in the orbit and so forth. So then uh, this looks very promising to say, well, it's going to be more expensive to add a controller, but it could be a cheaper alternative to uh, increasing the stiffness of the tubes. And uh, with this multi-body dynamics, with the nonlinear flex bodies, now we can finally start solving these systems, um, you know, that, that combine a lot of motion as well as a lot of flexibility. And then to be able to also add the controller, um, then uh, that really opens up a, a big opportunity. So, you know, overall summary, you know, it's uh, been very useful then to have Recordine, the fact that the full flex is so well integrated, very convenient to use. Um, uh, you know, we could have a, like another presentation talking about some of the contact development, but you know, Recordine has contacts that can be applied um, both to uh, rigid and flexible bodies in a consistent way. So, I mean, things like that make it, uh, you know, very approachable. Uh, to apply Recordine to these very complex problems. You know, so we're, we're talking about doing multi-physics with just a lot of help. And then, uh, then to add to that, to have ProcessNet to be able to script custom dialog boxes and, and uh, script certain processes to automatically take care of things and reduce the burden on the engineer it really uh, helps uh, efficiency, but also uh, makes things easier to use, easier to approach. Um, you know, try to build in uh, some of the uh, intelligence needed, you know, for a particular class of problems, build that right into the script uh, rather than, you know, the most senior analyst brain or something like that. So that, that can really help. And uh, even more can be done and actually has been done uh, with particle-based fluids and bulk materials and then the full flexing and uh, large motions. Uh, we've actually done some really amazing things, uh, some of which are customer private, but uh, it's been uh, amazing to do that. And so with that capability, you know, MotionPort is working with EngineSoft and, uh, you know, we are, you know, both ready and anxious to, you know, help all of you uh, with these, uh, addressing these kind of problems and both, uh, you know, people who aren't uh, currently our customers as well as our current clients, I think, uh, there's always more that we can do uh, to just make the process uh, more efficient uh, for you. And uh, so please let us know uh, in what ways we can help you with that. And with that, uh, that is my presentation. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Brent. Um, so we have a few questions. Uh, looks like Alex Arugo. I hope I said that correctly. Please forgive me, Alex, if I didn't. Um, they were curious about the uh, materials used in the model. Uh, were they possibly carbon fiber? Oh, that's a great point. Um, so uh, on, on some of these types of problems with the lightweight structures, actually it is a composite material. And um, <clears throat> so uh, to, to look at the details of all the layers and everything of all the, of all the composite materials, uh, you know, details, uh, that ends up being uh, quite burdensome, you know, when you're working on at the system level. Uh, so what we do on that one is uh, uh, basically uh, the uh, contractor who is doing these solar arrays, they had information, um, you know, extracted about the mesh. So one part of it is looking at, um, you know, what is the modulus of the material as far as, you know, in the stretching direction, 
And then, uh, you know, so we look at kind of stretching, bending, and then we want to have it in the two different directions uh, where loads are applied. So that's what we did is uh, we have an orthotropic uh, material definition and uh, we take that uh, data from test and applied it and uh, that was enough to you know, provide the accurate answers that I uh, described earlier. Thank you very much. It looks like we have another question um, and you may have already answered some of all, uh, this already. Um, from Ahmad, could you please elaborate on the finite element description of the flexible body uh, on the tube, such as type of elements, et cetera? Also, what type of nonlinear finite element formulation are you using for modeling the tube? Okay, great question. Um, so what we're doing is that our finite element approach, as far as you know, the notion of the shape functions for the different elements, is uh, very much compatible with you know the standard uh, you know finite element approach you know used in other commercial software. Uh, the difference is that uh, in Recordine, each of the nodes is its own body, and so that way, in that way, um, we can uh, propagate you know both uh, translations as far as you know stretching motions, and also the rotation with bending and the translation with bending, uh, that all propagates through the mesh. Um, uh, so we're actually, on, on this particular study, we're actually using linear material properties, but we have a nonlinear geometry approach because of the nodes being separate bodies. So then the deformations uh, propagate through the mesh and accumulate. And so locally at the element, uh, it's assumed to be linear. Um, but then overall, then we're going through this very large motion. So uh, in, in doing this kind of uh, work, then we just have to make sure that we have the proper resolution of the mesh so that the assumption of the linear behavior uh, is valid. And uh, we've applied this to many different types of models and have gotten you know, very high fidelity uh, you know, validation um, uh, with it. So, uh, you know, it's, it does take a little bit of attention to make sure, you know, you, you can always go back and check, you know, the stresses and so forth and, and uh, you know, check to make sure that the mesh resolution is correct, um, but it can work very well. So that's, and as, as far as uh, nonlinear material properties, uh, that is also available in Recordine, but we didn't use it for this example. Um, but you can do elastic plastic um, uh, type of materials. It does uh, run a little bit longer and uh, you need to define the proper, you know, sort of kinematic relationships uh, related to the plastic deformation. But uh, we use the common, uh, you know, plastic deformation techniques. I mean, we have, uh, I think, five of them uh, available. So you pick uh, the, the technique of interest and then provide the appropriate inputs to that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and then I have one more question from John at Raytheon. Um, he was asking, are there any other no code automation options? Any other, uh, what, what code? No code automation options. Not oh, 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 I see. Um, so the, uh, uh, the approach with ProcessNet is that um, it's built on Microsoft Visual Studio and it uses all of the, you know, common capabilities, you know, that are pretty well known by people. Um, and it supports any .NET, .NET language. So, um, you know, people have found that it's quite useful. Um, as far as uh, a no-code option uh, for automation, uh, you know, there, we have in Recordine uh, what's called expressions. And in the expressions, there's uh, some, uh, you know, certain functions. Um, and part of those functions is, are, 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 you know, certain things, you know, that include some kind of logic checks. So, for example, um, you know, one could define like a very simple controller just by setting up, 
appropriate uh, statements, you know, in these expressions. And, and it's, it's all part of the standard model, so it doesn't require any coding per se or any separate compiling. You just, you know, put the logic into the expression. So, so I would say that's, that's the option uh, to, to do a non-code version is just set up these function expressions to, you know, and they can be used to control motions or forces or whatever. Um, uh, also things like check for certain conditions uh, and then uh, you just set up that expression to have a value of zero or one uh, depending um, on, on uh, what's happening with the system. And then, for example, you would just reference that expression and then that could be a way to automatically stop the simulation once you've achieved, you know, a certain condition, for example, so. I would also class um, eTemplate, which is like an Excel-based automation system uh, as like a no-code option. So it's, you know, not as robust as the fully coded process net. Um, but it does let you kind of automatically set up and configure models uh, just based on like an Excel template uh, versus using the process net approach. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so eTemplate, uh, I mean, we have a number of clients using that um, and, you know, we're just really happy about it. Um, you know, since it's in Excel, then it's very approachable to people. And uh, so, you know, the focus on uh, eTemplate, you know, is all about model creation. And um, it, it, it's really a nice way to kind of lay out the model and then, uh, you know, an Excel spreadsheet and then people can kind of glance over everything at, a, at you know, one look. So uh, that's, that's a good way too. Wonderful. Uh, does anybody else have any questions they want to submit? Uh, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you great. Is this Hello? Fabiano? Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, I'm Fabiano from Italy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, great work. Um, I have a little question. I mean, this, this project started basically from flexible bodies because all the structures were flexible. So here there was no option. But in, in, in general practice, you might deal with, uh, with mechanisms when, that you can model either using the uh, a flexible approach or using rigid approach. But what happens if you create a rigid model and you realize at the end of your work that you needed flexible body? How do you handle that situation? Well, that's a great question. So uh, Recordine has a uh, special capability called the G manager, which means, you know, general body manager. And what that allows you to do is that when you start out and define your model, um, and, and let's say you have all these rigid components, and then you decide, oh, this one body here should really be flexible. Then what you can do is go into the G manager, select that body, and then, th then indicate, okay, do I want this to be um, a full flex body, or should it be a reduced flex body, which is a uh, flex body based on modes? So, uh, and then uh, depending on your selection, then basically it guides the user through all the setup to convert it into a flex body. And it retains as much information as possible from the model. So in other words, uh, you know, the joint that's attaching to that particular rigid body now is attached to the flex body. And, uh, you know, the details that need to be done are all you know, shown to the user and automated as much as possible. Same with contacts. Um, so that's uh, the work that's been done to make the contacts uh, uh, consistent between rigid and flexible bodies comes into play where the contact definition is just retained and just is ready to use. So the, yeah, the G manager in Recordine is, you know, it's a fairly new capability. It's been around for a number of years. Um, and uh, if anyone is, you know, interested in applying that, and maybe they haven't so far, you know, please let us know, and we're glad to help you with that uh, uh, to get used to taking advantage of that. Thanks. Very good. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I it's eleven thirty nine now, or twelve thirty nine uh, Eastern time. So uh, with that, I believe. I don't want to take anybody else's time, so um, we'll go ahead and move on unless there's any other questions. 
I think uh, I just wanted to wrap up with one point. Um, Hannah, I think we're going to be sending out a recording of this uh, this webinar. So um, anybody that maybe wasn't able to uh, attend or anybody that wants to use it as reference, um, they'll be able to see it. Um, and then as part of that, you'll have our contact info. If you think of a question as soon as you get off the phone, um, you'll be able to, to shoot us a message and, and we can um, answer it for you then. And, and one additional thing is the, uh, the technical papers that were given, uh, you know, are, you know, written up, developed as part of this, uh, these AI AA presentations are also things that we can provide to you. So if you're interested uh, in looking at the technical papers, uh, please let us know. Wonderful. All good points. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Thanks a lot.